All right, thanks everyone so much for coming. We're delighted to see all of you, especially during Thanksgiving week. I know many people have travel plans and family plans, so I'm delighted that you could make it for what is sure to be a very interesting conversation with uh, someone that I know well is one of the most profound thinkers about privacy, antitrust, national security, and how these issues all combine in the global technological environment. I'll just very briefly introduce our speaker, uh, and then uh, we can get into it. Uh, Noah Phillips uh, was nominated by former President Trump to be a commissioner of the Federal Trade Commission, and he was unanimously confirmed in April of 2018. Before that, he served for seven years as chief counsel to one of our two senators, Senator John Cornyn, uh, on the Senate Judiciary Committee, where he dealt with all the issues within the aegis of that very important body. Before that, uh, he practiced at various prestigious law firms. Uh, you can tell us about that part of your career if, at some point if you like, but um, I won't dwell on it too much. He's a graduate of Dartmouth College and Stanford Law School. Uh, so very impressive credentials and breadth of experience. We're delighted to have you here in Texas, back in Texas for you, a place that you know well. I should also mention he clerked uh, for Judge Prado on the Fifth Circuit, a graduate of UT Law School as well. So many Texas connections here, many Texas legal connections here. So I think it's especially appropriate that Noah Phillips is here to join us today. Thank you so much for coming. Adam, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Um, I was just sharing with Adam privately that the last time I was in this room, this courtroom, was right after Katrina. Because the Fifth Circuit, uh, I had started clerking, I think about a week, maybe two, before Katrina hit. The Fifth, Cir the Fifth Circuit started riding circuit. They started sitting. Um, not in their courthouse in New Orleans. And so we found ourselves in Houston, uh, and among other places, we found ourselves right here uh, at UT Law School. So it is really nice. Um, I'm embarrassed to say how long that has been, but it is great to be back here. It's great to be here with Adam, uh, of whom I am very admiring and very fond. Um, and uh, I should just caveat that what I'm gonna say today is just my own view and not necessarily the views of others on the commission. Um, and thanks to you and the Strauss Center and UT Law School. Great, thank you. And I wanna, I wanna briefly make a point about uh, data and national security. We don't usually think of the FTC as a national security agency, and you'll tell us in a moment about what the FTC does. But uh, as my students know, and I see at least one of them here today, uh, data is power in this era, where it's a global intelligence competition. Uh, and so the personal data that we all have and share with companies is something that our government wants and other governments want. And so the role of the FTC in protecting privacy is potentially a very consequential one not just for consumers, but for national security as well. Uh, Noah, can you tell us about the FTC's role in data privacy? What do you guys do, and what do other agencies do in the federal government, and maybe states as well? Sure. So maybe a little bit of historical background uh, is probably helpful, in particular to the students. So the FTC is the oldest continually, or still running, independent agency in the United States government. Uh, our statute was passed in 1914 signed into law by President Wilson, um, and we began uh, opening our doors in 1915. There was a pre-existing independent agency, the Interstate Commerce Commission, which doesn't really exist in that form uh, anymore. It has a vestigial existence as part of the Department of Transportation. So the FTC was set up to root out unfair methods of competition, which was some body of conduct that included, but went a little bit further than the antitrust laws. Um, at the time. And uh, one of the things we started doing fairly soon after we were founded is what we now think of as consumer protection. We started taking the position that if you were out there in the marketplace lying to people, right, my product is this, and it didn't really do that, or you didn't have a good basis to believe it did that, um, that had a negative impact on competition, and it surely on some level does. But we got into a little bit of uh, legal hot water, um, and the Supreme Court basically said, unless you're showing an impact on competition, that's not what your law is intended to address. And so, and I promise I'm getting to privacy, in 1938, they passed some amendments to our statute that gave us what we now think of today as consumer protection authority, uh, or sometimes we call it UDAP authority, that is unfair and deceptive acts and practices. And to get to the state point, Throughout America, I'm not sure every state, but most states at least, have what we call the Baby FTC Act. So you have state attorneys general or other state authorities that also can pursue unfair and deceptive acts and practices. 
So one of the benefits of the words unfair and deceptive are that they're pretty broad. Now we've done a little bit work, a little bit of work over history in narrowing and making clear what those words mean. But what they basically allow us to do as an agency is go ferret out market problems um, that are hurting consumers, and even if there hasn't been new legislation, declare them illegal. And over time, through case-by-case -case adjudication, in some cases through regulation, the promulgation of rules, or some other stuff that we can do in the middle, guidance and things like that, uh, we've been able to sort of track market development and give guidance to businesses about what they should be doing, and occasionally slap businesses that are doing what they should not be doing. And two of the areas that I think are really important in this regard are data security and privacy. So really since the 1970s, the FTC, and this has developed over time, has started pursuing these ends as consumer protection. We've also been given some authority by Congress in specific contexts, so the most famous of which is protecting kids, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, or COPPA. But we've done a lot of the work that we've done on privacy and on data security under that original organic statute from the 1930s. And so um, that work continues today. Uh, we continue to do investigations. We continue to bring enforcement actions. Some settle. Occasionally, we have a litigation. Um, we issue guidance to the market on what firms are supposed to be doing again and supposed to not be doing. Um, but that's how we come into the world of privacy and data security. Privacy is a term that we hear a lot. And people like to throw it around. But we rarely define with precision exactly what we're talking about. So how do you, as a regulator, think about privacy? Do you think about it through the lens of choice? A company wasn't clear enough about what it was wanted to do or was going to do with your data? Do you think about it as a question of dignity? Do you think about it as a question of market power? The person who has the data has the power. How do you look at it? And obviously, that will inform your approach to regulation. Sure. Um, and I think this is a really important question, because unfortunately, there's a lot of public policy debate about privacy and very little public policy discussion about what exactly are the problems that we're trying to address here. There was a study that the Department of Commerce conducted a few years ago during the Trump administration, which basically asked people, like, when you hear privacy, what do you think about? And the number one answer uh, that people gave is basically like ID theft, right? protections against ID theft. I don't want bad guys to, um, to get my data. And I think we all kind of agree that we don't want bad guys to get our data. Um, the dignity question is an interesting one because at least for me, while dignity is a very important value, it doesn't lend itself to a lot of rigor and analysis, and it's subject to a lot of subjectivity, right? Something that might be a cut against one person's dignity might strike another person, and this is especially true in the context of privacy, as not a bad thing at all. So I'll throw him under the bus here. My dad loves the fact that when he uses Gmail, the ads are targeted at him. Like, he finds that to be convenient, he finds out about products that he knows. Other people view this as creepy, right? Um, and there are kinds of creepinesses that I think are very fairly cognizable in law. So we've brought some cases involving stalking apps. These are like real, very clear privacy harms. But a lot of the privacy discussion is had in a space where I think there's a lot less social agreement. And so sussing out what is and what isn't illegal, right, should what people sometimes call behavioral or targeted advertising, be legal, um, is a question that requires a lot more social consensus that I think we have in the context of privacy. So one thing you also mentioned, Adam, is market power. Um, it is certainly true that firms can use data um, to advantage themselves, right? Just like firms have done from time immemorial um, and just like they can do with respect to other aspects of business, like scale economies and that sort of thing. Um, when data collection or privacy becomes a market power problem in the sense of inhibiting competition, I think is a much more difficult issue. Uh, it's very easy to say words out loud, like this company's agglomeration of data gives them market power. But I think once you start to sort of peel the onion, a lot of these questions get a lot more complex. 
Maybe we can pause here and talk about big tech. It's a topic on everyone's mind, ranging from market power, antitrust, censorship. These are very hot button debates that are at the center of the political discussion today. Uh, how does antitrust relate to privacy? How does the size and scale of these companies that are collecting data affect how they treat the data and whether consumers have a choice? And relatedly, do you think these issues will self-correct through competition or are the network effects so powerful that there really is not the possibility of meaningful competition on privacy? Okay, so I object to the compound question. Uh, maybe <laughs> we'll do a couple of those in order. Let me start with the following. There is certainly a sense in which we can think of competition and privacy as working together, right? So you can definitely imagine a world in which if you had some kind of competition, the result would be more privacy. But the question that I would ask about that proposition is the same question I would ask about any proposition with respect to competition and whatever the result is that we want. And the question is, is the thing that we want the result of natural market competition, right? Is the market going to bear this thing out? And I would submit that when it comes to privacy, it's not so clear that that's actually the result. And what I mean is the following. I see privacy problems with big firms, right? I think a lot of us do. But I also see privacy problems with little firms, firms that have no obvious market power in any regard, right? We have seen firms with sloppy privacy practices that are huge, some in the middle, and some that are very small. So it's certainly not true, right, that only with market power can you get away with bad privacy. The question I would ask as an antitrust enforcer is often, is how is whatever the conduct in question inhibiting privacy? So for example, I, I like to give um, the hypothetical of Google buys DuckDuckGo, right? So DuckDuckGo is a competitor of Google and it distinguishes itself on privacy. You will see these billboards, especially around Washington. I don't know if they've hit Austin yet. I haven't seen them so far on my trip. Um, if Google were to buy DuckDuckGo, I would be very interested in what effect that that might have on canceling out this competition for privacy, right? So there, there's competition for it. But I think most people agree that privacy isn't like the naturally occurring result of free market forces. This, by the way, is the whole argument for a privacy law. It's the whole argument for regulation, which is that the market is not bearing the thing out. The other thing is this, and I think this is important. There are certain senses in which what privacy aims at doing which is essentially closing off access to data about consumers, is to some extent contrary to what we hope for in competition. So we hear a lot of talk in tech about walled gardens, right? That certain firms especially are able to like keep others away from their data. And what have you seen of late? You've seen complaints about Apple's iOS 14 rollout, right? And the prompts that you get, the tracking prompts, app tracking transparency. We've seen Competition complaints about Google shutting off access through Chrome to third-party cookies. Here, what you see is a tension between the two. The data is important to firms. They want access to it, but other firms are canceling out access. So competition might support more access to data. And it's not that the two never align. It's that we need a much more granular discussion of the context where they line up and where they move in opposite directions. Uh, on the regulatory plane, there's a clamor for the FTC to act. There's also a clamor for Congress to act. Some of these judgments that you're talking about strike me as quite subjective, as line drawing problems of the type that we normally assign to legislators in our system. Is it your view that, that the pressure on the FTC to act is mistargeted and that we should really be waiting for Congress to pass a new federal privacy law before regulatory agencies start to, start to mix in here? So I do think that when you're talking about something like privacy, where we had to start our discussion about definitions, like what are we even talking about? Which in policy speak is what problem are we solving? Um, I think Congress, well, first of all, that. Second, when we're talking about privacy, I think we are necessarily talking about real trade-offs. A lot of the behaviors that people have in the context of the privacy debate are not wholly bad. There are things when people can where people can disagree, or there are things that could be negative, but also produce a lot of benefits. And that means we're having a conversation about trade-offs. And when you're talking about big policy judgments, you're talking about lack of agreement on definition, 
you're talking about potentially huge impact on markets, right? Lots of different firms transacting data about people, tens of thousands at the least. <coughs> Excuse me. There, I think Congress is the best body to address those issues. Can you explain to, to the audience how the United States regulates privacy now and how that differs, would differ from a federal, overarching federal privacy law and also how it differs from what Europe does. Some of you may have heard of the General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR. We all got a bunch of spam emails about a year and a half ago or two years ago when GDPR was being rolled out with companies informing us of changes to their privacy practices. So how does the United States do it now? What are people advocating for us to get away from? What's wrong with and right with the way we're doing things at present? Sure. So in the main, in the US federal government, what you have is a series of particular laws related to privacy that address a series of specific concerns or harms. So the first privacy law in the United States is uh, the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Uh, we generally consider that a kind of privacy law. And this is a law that governs the rights and responsibilities between consumers and credit reporting agencies. And the issue that this addresses is that the people who put in a lot of information <coughs> who generate the files that allow you access to credit, right, when you're buying a car or a home or even a lot of more sort of pedestrian activity, um, are not people with whom you interact. And people, persons, corporations, whatever, but you get what I'm saying. Um, they gather data from you about market transactions that you have, and then they feed that information to other market participants who are making decisions about you. Am I going to extend you this loan at this rate of this car? So FICRA addresses that. We've got, I mentioned before, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. We have the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act. So that's particular to financial services firms. COPPA, again, particular to kids. We've got a bunch of health privacy laws, right, like HIPAA. And so what essentially has emerged is a patchwork of areas where the government, through the democratic process, the regulatory process, what have you, <coughs> excuse me, has identified areas of heightened concern. And these kind of make sense, right? Like kids, health data, financial data. These are areas where if there are breaches, we're all kind of naturally more concerned. But what I think a lot of people are beginning to realize or be beginning to feel maybe is that, hold on, our data is being collected and different kinds of data are being collected and used in lots of different ways. And maybe we need to think more holistically about this, right? Maybe we need clear rules of the road for people for firms, um, data about location, right? Data about browsing history. Lots of categories of data are being used and monetized in ways. And so I think that's the goal of a more general law. There's some other particulars, but I think that's where GDPR tries to go, and that's the move in Congress for a larger Do you think we need that? I think we do. I think it's time for a privacy law. The things that strike me, first of all, I think it's good for companies to have kind of clearer rules of the road, right? I don't want people investing, no offense, more in lawyers. I want them investing more in engineers. I want there to be a coherent scheme where we all kind of get how it works. So you can think of like writing checks, right? We all kind of, well, God, that's a bad example in today's America. You may have to explain that to some of the students in the a audience. A check. Um, <laughs> So, um, so I think it's good for companies to have kind of one coherent national rule. But I also think, and this is critical, that it's good for consumers. Right? I think it's good for people to kind of have a sense, all right, I've clicked yes. This is what they're going to do with my data. This is in, this is out, and maybe there's a gray area and we figure out how to do it. But I do think there's a really big benefit to people. Two of the things that you often hear are a sense of confusion. What's going on with my data? And second, a sense of powerlessness. I have no control over it. Um, and I think where rules are clear and people have a sense of what's allowed and what's not, uh, we can do something to remedy that. To be clear, the way that data are collected about us, the way that they are processed, the way that they are used, the counterparties to whom they are sold is so complex that I don't know that we'll all ever have like a full understanding of everything that's going on. But I do think we can do better as a matter of law. And so I do think um, it would be good if Congress, Congress has been debating this for years now. Why hasn't it happened yet? Um, well, first of all, Congress is supposed to take time. <laughs> um, I used to work in Congress. 
I think the big issue that people seem to be stuck on actually isn't what the substantive liability standards should be. Right? I think we have a general sense that firms shouldn't lie about what they're doing with data, that sort of thing. The big issue actually seems to be the remedial scheme. Should we have one law or a multiplicity of state laws? Should individuals be able to enforce that law or just the government? These kinds of questions. But those are really important questions. So right now we have California, Illinois setting the pace with their state privacy laws. Do you think that patchwork is good? Is that the laboratories of democracy? Or is that paralyzing for businesses as they try to compete in a national market? So I really, it is both paralyzing for businesses, because they, this is very much interstate commerce, and people are trying to compete nationally, but also for consumers, right? Trying to understand what their rights are, or you're reading privacy notices, and like, but if you're in California, X, Y, Z. Got it, great. So let's, let's shift gears a bit and talk about how this affects national security. We all know about some of the famous data breaches that have happened in, in the United States over the years, Anthem, OPM, and at least publicly, those have been attributed to the Chinese government. And that's, that's the elephant in the room. I don't think we, we should talk around it. China is a peer competitor of the United States at this point. This is largely an intelligence competition. And not all of the data that's interesting to intelligence agencies is in government hands. A lot of it is in private hands. You can learn a heck of a lot from a data set of a health insurer or of a hotel company. Marriott was hacked also. And obviously, security clearance records. Um, and so how should we think about national security and the link with data privacy Chinese companies acquiring American companies, for example, is something that is within the FTC's jurisdiction. Um, how do you think about Chinese mergers, for example? Do you look at that through the lens of national security, or are you looking at it solely through a commercial lens? So a couple of points. Um, I think in general, you know, the FTC is not a national security authority. Like That's not our job in the government. It is very much commercial regulation, and that includes, includes looking at mergers. One thing I think, though, is definitely true as we see more Chinese entry in America is that some of the firms may not be competing in ways that are sort of familiar to us or that resonate with the way that we look at like antitrust. So let me give an example. We have more investment by state-owned entities. The portfolio companies of state-owned entities may or may not be market actors in the way that our market You mean Chinese, Chinese government owned entities? Well, it could be broader than Chinese, okay. but yes. Right. Um, to the extent you're not profit maximizing, right? to the extent you're not out there looking to do the things we assume all firms will do, we need to think more deeply about how you're going to behave in the market. And maybe we need to hear from our partners in the national security agencies about what we know about por how portfo portfolio companies operate. One thing I've called for and there's a bill now, um, is for us to get a notification when we're looking at a merger so that we can understand from a market perspective what we're dealing with. Let me get to the other issue, though. We do have authorities in the US, and I think these are good ones, that can look at transactions, including mergers, um, from a national security perspective. And these are national security experts informed by all the information that they have about what's going on. So you saw this. Um, with the divestiture order involving Grindr, right? So Grindr gathers a lot of information that is very potentially sensitive, right? Who are you sleeping with? Where are they? Um, are you a homosexual, right? Like that could be used, we know this from national security investigations, to compromise certain people. And so I do think it is important, um, and Congress has stepped up on this. I have to brag on John Cornyn, right? He worked with Dianne Feinstein to pass a big update to the CFIUS law. Right, which is the Committee on Foreign Investment in the US, to allow the national security agencies greater power to look at more transactions to make sure that, among other things, American privacy is protected. Let's talk about Chinese-owned platforms. TikTok is probably the most famous example. I'm sure some of you use TikTok. The FTC had a TikTok case a few years ago. And obviously, the Trump administration attempted to force TikTok to be divested and sold to an American owner and did not succeed in that. The Biden administration has taken a different tack on that. What do you think the right approach to these Chinese-owned platforms are? Should the United States allow them to compete but subject them to restrictions? Should we force them to be owned by American entities, given the sensitivity of the data they collect? How do you think about these? So because I'm a competition guy, right? Like my instinct is always competition. But I recognize that here you have a set of issues that are really national security in nature. And so I think those are the circumstances where the national security agencies really need to be the ones. I mean, Congress 
the executive, and the national security agencies really need to be the ones um, giving the answer and giving the instruction. I'll tell you a story about TikTok. So we brought our case against TikTok. Um, it was actually titled Musical.ly, which is the American antece antecedent, um, in 2018. And about three months after I worked on the case, my then seven-year-old daughter came home talking about the Momo hoax. This was like an internet hoax a few years ago. And my wife and I are trying to explain to her, you know, don't worry, it's just a hoax, it's not real. And then at one point I said, wait a minute, when are you on the internet and we don't know about this? This is a seven-year-old kid. And she goes, oh, I go to insert friend's house and we play TikTok. So here I am, right? We just brought a case against this company and I'm blithely unaware that my seven-year-old is at a friend's house using the app. Um, kids are going to be on these apps, right? This is, TikTok is very popular right now. Payments, the Chinese are running circles around the US on payments, I worry. Um, this is going to be an increasing trend over time, and I think increased government attention is warranted. Is there a gulf between people who think about things from a commercial perspective, as you primarily do, and people like me, and I see Paul Pope here, who see the world from a security perspective? Uh, we saw a story in the New York Times this weekend about uh, an important mine in Congo that the US government had spent hundreds of millions of dollars over the years to keep in friendly hands, uh, and then suddenly, Chinese acquisition. Uh, much to the detriment of the U.S. government and U.S. national security and our future in green energy uh, and battery manufacturing. And that story really emphasized that this was analyzed through a commercial lens, completely missing the important security implications. And it strikes me that with things like TikTok, with things like Alipay, you talked about payments. This is the Alibaba payments platform. I see it popping up in the United States, and I'm wondering whose job is it to scrutinize this and where the data is going. So whose job is it to make sure that businesses that are penetrating the US market are actually not damaging our national security? Or does that fall in the gaps in a way that's potentially perilous for the United States? So I don't know that it falls in the gaps because I do think increasingly, and you mentioned some of the efforts in the Trump administration, these are areas of focus for a lot of people. I, and I'm not sure there's a gap in different agendas. I, my point is that when it comes to antitrust enforcement, that's where the antitrust enforcers need to be. We have neither the institutional expertise nor the tools to focus on national security, and I wouldn't want others relying on that. Would right. you consider um, if, if Alipay or TikTok were sharing data with the Chinese government in a way that was not advertised in their terms of service, would you consider that the type of privacy violation, the type of deceptive practice that would fall within the FTC's jurisdiction? Yes. I mean, when you're doing things that are contrary to the representations you're making, that absolutely can invite, um, because that is also a commercial problem. And just to be clear, there can be problems that are both problems from a commercial perspective and a national security one, but I do think you don't want to leave this to one agency, the tools of which are intended to do A, um, when what you're really trying to achieve is B. I think it's very important to have the B guys working on that. And I don't mean that as like a value judgment that one is A and the other is <laughs> We've talked a lot about regulation. Obviously, lawyers, we love to talk about regulation because it's something we can do. Let's talk about something that maybe lawyers can't do very well, which is innovation. Are you, and of course, innovation is going to be the basis of our future, future national power, our global leadership, our strength in the world, jobs here, and our prosperity. Are you concerned that the pro-regulatory trend in Washington, potentially, as pertains to technology, is going to impede innovation? Yes. Um, I think that one of the ways that America has continued to be innovative over time, um, and forgive me, but I don't know that we see this in Europe to the same extent, is that we have protected consumers where we need to, but also allowed markets to work. Right? We've allowed investment to flow to companies. We've allowed, um, to some extent, wiggle room for those companies to make mistakes. That's important. Um, but the winds are trending not in that direction. So I'll give an example. Uh, the House just passed a gigantic spending package. It does a lot of things. But one of the things that it does is it gives the FTC the ability to penalize a firm in the first instance for violating unfair or deceptive acts and practices. So there's a lot of complaining that, like, how could you not penalize a company that violates the law? Missed in those complaints, though, is the fact that our authority is really broad. We get to go out there in the market and say, oh, wait, we think that's illegal. When you combine deterrence with unclear standards of liability, what you get is chilled innovation. That's not good. 
it's OK to say, here are the rules. And then you broke the rules, and we're going to fine you. But if you say, we're going to fine you, but we're not going to tell you what the rules are in advance, people hold back. And that is inimical to innovation, and that's something that I worry about. The example I sometimes give is like if you're driving. It's perfectly reasonable for the government to post a sign that says, don't drive more than 65 miles an hour. And if you do, we'll penalize you. It's insane for the government to say, don't drive at an unreasonable rate. Right? What's that? Who's judging? Um, and penalize you for driving at an unreasonable rate. I'm going to invite you here to um, criticize people. It may not be wise for you to criticize. But why do you think this is the case? Is it a lack of understanding of technology? Is that there are too many lawyers in government? Is it something about the state of our politics today? Um, I think there is a view that is popular in a lot of circles that if law enforcers, regulators just did more, we would have better X, Y, Z. And I submit that this is a very shallow approach to a series of comp complex questions. The question I always have is like, what is the thing that you're aiming at? Right? So you were talking about big tech before. A censorship concern is not the same necessarily as a competition concern, is not the same as a privacy concern. So what are the problems? Um, what do you think is the regulatory failure? And then let's talk about it. But just giving regulators a lot more power to determine how businesses operate without clear go goals in mind, I don't know that that's necessarily the right way. It certainly hasn't been our path. And while people have quibbles with how markets have developed, I think in general, the trend in America, you know, if you look back 30, 40, 50 years, has been overwhelmingly innovative and overwhelmingly positive. Um, and I think that's important. What do you think, I'm going to ask you to be a forecaster here a little bit, which is always a risky game. What innovations in technology are you tracking as potentially the most consequential, whether it's for competition, whether it's for privacy, for innovation? Oh, gosh. I mean, you know, like AI, blockchains, AR, VR. There's lots of really cool stuff going on. Um, and I think we want to continue to have lots of really cool things going on in America. How do you look at AI as a as a, a privacy issue, potentially. We know that Europe, for one, has taken, as is, it often does, a very cautious approach in GDPR, already limiting the types of applications that AI can be used for uh, in a way that probably impedes innovation. Uh, how do you see AI? Do you see it through the lens of privacy? Do you see it as very promising? I mean, I think we can do both, right? I think we should probably stipulate that there is great promise in AI to drive innovation, to, you know, lower the costs of goods, to make transactions more efficient, lots of things, right? Sell products to more people than you thought you could otherwise. But computers are getting smarter about what they know about us. Um, and if your problem is that people that are not you know a lot about you based on your behavior online, AI will exacerbate that. Um, but I do think, you know, we should be very careful in just sort of saying, this is a new technology. Let's stop it before it develops. Um, that hasn't traditionally been the American path. And I think that's one of the reasons we have the innovation that we do in America. Uh, can you talk about algorithms and the business's obligation to the customer with respect to algorithms? A lot of your authority, as you noted, relates to unfair or deceptive practices. Do you think businesses should have to disclose their algorithms? So or at least what the algorithm is solving for? Um, I don't know that there's an affirmative obligation. I think sh that's should, a, should there be such an obligation? Right. I think we'd have to think about what is it that we want people to know. Uh, one of the things about algorithms, um, there's lots of different kinds of algorithms, is right. disclosure may end up just overwhelming people with information that isn't particularly meaningful. But inputs being right and thinking about how we structure them is, I, I think, a really important area for future conversation. For example, we all, not we all, but many of us use algorithmically sorted news feeds, whether it's on Facebook, whether it's on Twitter, whether it's even on Google News or Apple News. You click on something, that indicates that that topic engages you. You're likely to get more. You'll keep clicking because it's fed you the most engaging t content on that topic. You'll click again, a and you get into a potentially a feedback loop with the algorithm where you're sliding down an ever steeper slope towards extreme positions. Unfortunately, we've seen this all over the political spectrum in American public life. Some people have speculated that if these companies were forced to disclose that their algorithms are solving for engagement and exactly how that works, even if the individual consumer couldn't interpret that, then at least intermediaries in the press and academia who understand these things could provide expert analysis and that could potentially 
improve competition. Um, that's more of a comment than a question, but if sure. you have any response to that, we'd love to hear it. Yeah, you know, I guess what I'd say is the complexity here, I, I think there's a lot of truth to what you said, but the complexity here comes from the fact that another way to say that is, based on what you look at and like, we'll give you more, right? So you think about TikTok, right? You like this kind of video. You like the cats or the dancing or whatever it is, the guy with the, what is he drinking? Gatorade on the, in Utah on the skateboard? Um, oh, really? It's like a big TikTok thing. Um, I'm, I'm blanking on his name. Um, there's a lot of benefit to that. Um, I do think people understand that there are algorithms at play and that to some extent what goes into it is based on what you like. Um, whether that is an adequate disclosure uh, of all the risks that come, I don't know. Got it. Uh, I'm going to ask the obligatory crypto question here. There's a lot of talk now about Web 3.0. It's quite interesting, but it's, it's certainly in its infancy. Uh, how do you look at blockchain-based networks as a regulator? Obviously, the FTC's focus is typically on centralized entities with centralized decision-making and, of course, inside information. Distributed networks that are run by their participants often don't have a centralized entity, but nonetheless, they, they have the potential for very consequential effects on competition and so forth. Is this something that's on the agency's radar screen? We've seen the SEC coming out and talking about this, the Fed coming out and talking about potentially getting involved. Yeah, I mean, you know, the FTC is not going to offer a cryptocurrency anytime soon. <laughs> but what I will say is this. From, from the perspective of decentralizing things, distributed ledger technologies are really interesting, right? Um, and there are a lot of people who believe that blockchain writ large uh, offers a tremendous amount of revolutionary potential for many aspects of the economy. I do think, however, that there are some rules of the road that we've already seen violated. Right? So anytime you see market excitement in an area, what you see is scam artists. Right? And so we've brought some cases involving multi-level marketers and other kinds of companies that have used the enthusiasm around, in particular, crypto um, to scam people out of money. Um, there's a broader discussion to be had about the uh, impacts writ large. But I do think, like any other industry, there are certain rules of the road that folks uh, in crypto and applying blockchain technology need to follow. I'd like to just talk about careers a bit. This is largely a student audience, and I think it's always helpful for people to look at the very successful path that you've taken that our other guests have taken uh, and try to imagine what the future holds for them. You got a law degree. You practiced at very prestigious law firms, Cravath and Steptoe in Washington, uh, and then you worked in the Senate uh, for Senator Cornyn. Uh, can you explain how your time in private practice, which is most likely where many of our students will land initially after coming out, informed your future government service and led you to the path of government service? Sure. I think three things jumped to mind. So the first is I had the real privilege and opportunity to be around some lawyers who are a heck of a lot smarter than I am. And being trained by people who are very smart and really know what they're doing is like one of the great privileges in the world. It's one of the benefits of going to a place like UT Law School. I think that's thing number one. Thing number two. In fashioning public policy, uh, in thinking about the application of law, understanding some of the really basic legal principles that apply and that th firms think about, things like, you know, under what circumstances is the conduct you know, of Henry attributable to Lindsay? No, nothing personal, Lindsay. Um, <laughs> thinking about what the corporate veil means, how are corporations organized? A lot of the basic building blocks of lots of, and I did obviously commercial practice, practice at firms actually has a really big input in how we take the policies that we adopt by law or by regulation and how they get worked out. Um, and I felt it was really useful when I got to Capitol Hill to have a sense of sort of those principles of what I'll broadly call commercial law, corporate law, um, tort law, these kinds of things. Uh, the other thing is civil procedure. Right. So I worked on the Judiciary Committee, and a lot of what we did was legislation that was either directing uh, specifically or very close to what was going to go on in courts. And courts are, in a democratic society, and in particular in the United States, a lot of how we mediate law. Right? A lot of how policy gets applied, law gets applied. Agencies have to go through courts, thank God. Um, commercial opponents have to go through courts, individual plaintiffs. Classes of plaintiffs, all these have to go through courts. And so understanding civil procedure in the court system, very, very important. 
I think I had a third point, but now I forgot. How about tech? You're a tech regulator. Many of our students are interested in tech, want to practice in areas related to tech. How do you learn enough about technology to be able to practice intelligently if you're not highly technical or a coder? I mean, I think the most important thing is to listen and keep an open mind, right? And understand that you are continuing to learn. Technology is almost, by definition, always going to be faster than lawyers. Um, and understanding what you know and what you don't know is critical. And how about Congress? That was obviously a decisive point in your career. Uh, you worked for Senator Cornyn for seven years on one of the most important committees in the Congress. Um, what's the environment like up there? Obviously, as, as many of our students probably see, the partisan fire, firing in the media and perceive it in a certain way. Was that your experience, or is the experience more nuanced? What should people know if they're considering going to the Hill as a career stop? So the Hill is great, and I would encourage it. Let me start with that. Um, there are times of real partisanship. I, you know, on the Judiciary Committee, we deal with a lot of very divisive issues. Um, but there are also a lot of quiet areas of agreement. So I mentioned earlier this bill having to do with CFIUS. I spent, although we never got a bill done, I spent a lot of my time on Capitol Hill working on patents, which is not, if you had asked me in law school, where I thought I was going. Um, and sometimes the issues that are not big headline things, you know, like immigration or crime or what have you, allow for a lot more of the back and forth. I think privacy, to some extent, is one of those as well. Um, and it's really nice to be able to do that. Um, to be able to work with others. Um, I will sort of say nice things about him again. Um, Senator Cornyn is a person who's really interested in legislating. And I think for a number of years when I was with him, he would be like number one or number two or number three in terms of members whose bills got passed. Um, there is an art and a science to that. Um, and it's really interesting to learn from sort of one of the masters. That's great. Um, I, I would encourage the audience to start thinking of your questions. Uh, we'll turn it over to the audience in just a second. I want to talk about Europe a little bit. This is something that you and I both dealt with during um, the, our coterminous period in government. Disagreements with, between the United States and Europe about national security policy after the Snowden disclosures. Um, and uh, as, just for background, Europe has, um, to a sig significant degree, tried to cut off data transfers between the United States and Europe because of concerns about American national security practices, surveillance by the NSA and other agencies. Um, why is Europe so upset? Do you think those criticisms have merit? Uh, and what do you see as the potential uh, downsides here for the United States? Do you think this dispute can be resolved? So I'll start with the last question. I hope this dispute can be resolved. Um, in particular, following the Snowden disclosures, and Adam, you, you're, you're far more expert at this than I, um, I think Americans were upset too. Right? A lot of people reacted negatively to some of what they saw as surveillance that was untethered. Um, there's a legal debate, but also to just the principles that they saw you know, the US government, or that they thought the US government should be adhering to. Um, Europe has continued, writ, Europe writ large has continued to press this issue in particular in the courts, um, lawsuits by a guy named Max Schrems um, that have repeatedly at this point, struck down the agreements that allow for a lot of data sharing. My concern with this is I often feel like these arguments are very one-sided. So they take into account what they have found the US to be doing, but there's almost no attention given to what European countries are doing. And I do think when you're having a discussion about what is the right level you know, between privacy and security, what is the right equipoise, um, you have to start with, taking into account both sides' view of security, as opposed to just looking at one side's focus on security versus your view of privacy. So famously, the European privacy laws don't care about European security practices. And I would think that if you were judging somebody else, you'd think, you know, sauce for the goose, sauce for the gander, this kind of thing. Um, I will say my worry and then my hope. My worry is that we break down data trading, which is largely mutually beneficial. If I had to draw lines in the world, the lines would be between the companies that have like fundamental agreement on democratic values, even including privacy, whatever the nuances of the law. You mean the countries? What did I say? Companies. I meant Birdie countries. Birdie and Slip, I'm sorry commercial regulator. <laughs> um, and those countries like China that don't, right? That they have a fundamentally different approach. Um, it is, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me 
for Europe to have freer data trade with countries that don't have democracy, don't have court oversight, they don't have the peak law where you used to serve, um, but for some reason U.S. trade is cut off. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Are you, do you think we should be concerned about a balkanized internet? It seems like we're moving in that direction. Every country to some extent regulates how data can move. We have HIPAA. I don't particularly want my health data being sent to China for storage. So every country imposes some restrictions, and we're increasingly seeing other countries get in the game. Obviously, Europe has its headline GDPR, which is a pretty high wall around the European border. India has its own sovereign prerogatives that it's, it's exerting. Of course, China is completely clamped down in terms of data transfers. Do you think we're moving towards a world of a balkanized internet where each country is its own walled garden for data? And if so, is that something that we should be concerned about, or is it inevitable? I think, well, you could be, both be concerned and it be inevitable. Um, I think we are moving in that direction, and I am concerned about it. Again, you know, I think the right lines are between the countries that share fundamental values and those that don't. Those are the lines that make most sense to me. I'd like to invite um, questions from our audience here, if we have any. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, in the back there? Lady in the back there? Yes, you. We have a mic, um, and it would be great if we could record the questions for our podcast listeners as well. Thank you. So I know that the, uh, the FTC had its hand in uh, basically requiring that like influencers <laughs> on the internet, they have to disclose whether or not they're being paid to uh, you know, promote these products. I was curious if that application would apply to only like companies that they're being paid for, or like just, I was, my thought was someone could pay a very highly profiled person to tweet about them as an individual. The, the tweet that comes to mind is like Ashton Kutcher. Someone was tweeting about him saying, oh, he does all this great work. And I was thinking what great free publicity in a sense that is. But people could also start doing that in a sense for these like high profiled you know, people to also pay them to you know, promote either ideas or individuals um, in kind of like a propaganda sense. Um, is that even... Uh, is that something that is enforceable or not in the same way that like, companies with these influencers are prohibited? So that's a great question. Should we regulate Ashton Kutcher and how? <laughs> um, no, but joking aside, um, what we do generally at FTC is like consumer protection. So one really important thing that I think we need to be focused on is like how are people being hurt? Um, and where someone is out there pushing a product and they're not disclosing that they're pushing it, I think you have a potential for a real misunderstanding and that can skew how markets function and hurt people. I think once you get into sort of in-kind benefits to conduct that is not necessarily commercial, like speech, um, getting into the business of to what extent you have to warrant some sort of relationship where you say something effectively nice about a person or you endorse it, your idea, I think that takes us down a more um, difficult path. Now, you know, and Ashton Kutcher might also be a commercial actor, right? He might be getting paid or he might be selling something, whatever, this is nothing personal to Ashton Kutcher. Um, there's a lot going on, right? We have, we have a lot more influencers. Their ability to influence at scale is much greater, right? This is one of the things about the internet. The ability to communicate at scale um, is, in certain senses, profoundly good, but it comes with profound costs, right? Misinformation can get out, right? Lies can get out. Um, the number of people that see you push a product without disclosing it can be um, a huge multiple. And we see, right, competition from these big companies uh, to try to get influencers on their platform because that drives more engagement. Um, and so I think just dealing with the commercial side alone um, is a pretty big, a pretty tall hill to climb. I think there's a... Hi, so um, I'm kind of interested in uh, the developments at the FTC. I know Lena Kahn was an academic and now she's one of the FTC commissioners. Um, and then I'm also generally curious about um, whether you think that privacy should reflect kind of what academics and policymakers think it ought to be or whether it should reflect what people think about privacy. And you kind of discussed um, that not all people, like your dad, um, care about targeted advertising. And, um, you know, academics have a grand idea of what privacy should be. And I'm just kind of curious where, 
where you think policymakers should land? I mean, I think in general, right, the policy is something that gets mediated through the democratic process, right? So ultimately, it is about people. You know, we have a Republican form of government, and so the feelings of the people are worked through a process to get to a place where we have that set. You know, there is a version of this that goes on, although it's not fundamentally democratic in the rulemaking process. You know, under the APA, you have notice and comment and that sort of thing. Um, academics inform that process, for sure. Uh, people read uh, things that they write, and they have a debate that goes on, and you, know, you hope that in the end, truth wins out. Um, I do think, though, that fundamentally, right, the democratic process is different from an academic process, um, and it's the former, the democratic one, that ought to rule out above all. The gentleman here, Lindsay. I'm uh, oh, sorry, can you, can you just use the oh, microphone so our podcast listeners can uh, hear? Bill Thank Hartman, you. Uh, could you tell us about your thoughts on uh, contracts of adhesion, to what extent they're being controlled now, and how do you think they should be controlled? This is a really interesting question. I think if you view contracts of adhesion from the lens of like a bargaining disjoint, one party is sort of more powerful than the other, they present an issue. But the flip side here I think is really important. We sign contracts of adhesion all the time. We do them online, right? We were talking about where you click through, right? That happens, God, many times a day. Um, but we also do them offline, right? I take my kids to the bouncy castle place to go to a birthday party and you have to sign something. Um, and I think that because of the way liability works in America um, and the often crippling liability that firms can face, um, having efficient contracting mechanisms can be really beneficial. Um, you know, there are other discussions I think to be had about like the terms of those contracts, um, but I do think you don't want to live in a world where you have to individually negotiate the particular terms of every single commercial transaction. It's just not efficient. It's, it's going to be terrifically annoying. Um, and I think that's, that's the difficult thing that we need to weigh. If negotiating the terms is not realistic, just given the number of transactions, does that counsel for regulatory intervention just to just put some terms clearly off limits? So this is part of what I mean in the context of privacy. I think that if you could narrow the terms that need to be negotiated, narrow the terms that need to be understood in any particular case, because you have broad rules, you could actually realize a lot of benefits. Does, that, does this mean that a, that a consumer choice model is not actually viable? And let me expand on what I mean there. Right? If, the, if, if our model of privacy is consumer choice, sure, the company can give you a very detailed menu of all the, cho the choices that you're making, and through your interaction with the company and the contract and in your privacy settings, you can choose exactly what privacy settings you mean. But for the reasons that we're talking about, that's not realistic. We don't have time. Company has much greater information. Do regulators need to make at least some default choices for users about their privacy settings? Well, or Congress. Or Congress. Um, I, think there, I think we ought to, ought to allow for part of that discussion. I think there's some things we can identify as harmful that we really need to, to, to maybe be a little bit more prescriptive. I am not wholly negative on consumer choice. I think what people want is an important part of how markets work. And correcting too much in favor of kind of a paternalistic, we will tell you what you can do and not, um, would be going the wrong direction. Should companies be allowed to sell your data onward to other actors purely in a commercial transaction? This is the sort of spy and sell model. Should that, be off, should that just be off the table, or should that be turned off by default? Absolutely. Um, well, I think those are two different often. questions. Should it be turned off by the four? There is a lot of economic activity in there. Um, and so a lot of that economic activity can be really good. It can also be pro competitive. Um, but I think, you know, if you look at like the FTC's report on data brokers, right? Data brokers kind of look a little bit like the consumer reporting agencies. Maybe the stakes are not as high, but we're worried that this group of entities that we're not proximate to. Um, are informing a lot of decisions about us, um, and maybe we need, we need a little bit more there. Yeah, I'm just speaking as the vox populi here, which maybe I'm not naturally suited to, but I'm going to try it anyway. It feels very creepy to have people selling information that is quite revealing about us to these other people who are just vacuuming it up and treating it 
without any respect, without any sense of reverence for what it reveals, merely as a commodity. Yeah, and I think creepiness, right? So to come back to sort of the first question about what does privacy mean, what is creepy is an important part of this discussion. Um, I just think that where it involves trade-offs, right, where there are going to be costs to what we do, we have to be very frank about, like, what is the creepiness we want to get at? And we need to think about the impact. So let me give an example. So I'm inclined to agree with you. It makes me a little bit unsettled that data that I give to X is being given to B, um, and I don't know anything about that. But understand the impact that this may have. One impact that it may have is it will favor the people who interact with you on a first-party basis. So the most ubiquitous companies gathering your data are now going to be more powerful, right? Because others won't have access to the same thing. I'm not saying that's not a trade-off worth making. What I am saying is it's a trade-off we need to recognize. Right, so Facebook and Google don't need to sell your data. They don't need to buy your data. They already have you as their audience. They already have it. Right, and so that means that because they have ex extremely detailed knowledge about you, the access that they have to you goes up in value even more, therefore producing an anti-competitive effect, arguably. Right, and so let's be clear about what we mean. A lot of what we're talking about as a practical matter is ads, right? How do the ads that you see online, when your IP address interacts with whatever, the website, how does that get to you, or you know, you're on an app? Um, where you have, the companies with the first party interaction with you over more time just have more information. It's not necessarily one to one. Having more data in and of itself doesn't necessarily tell you what you need to know. And they're aiming at a specific thing, right? They want to sell stuff, or they want to allow Procter and Gamble or whatever to sell stuff. Most important data, what you buy, right? What you buy is the most telling thing for what you're going to buy. It's why, right, you get those ads when you're about to purchase or you do purchase for the same thing, right? That makes a lot of sense. But, you know, if we cut off the access of the third parties, then all of the many like ad tech platforms that are out there that are trying to compete with the ad tech platforms of sort of the dominant consumer facing firms, they're going to be at a disadvantage. And to be clear, I'm not saying it's not worth it, but let's be honest about the trade-offs that we're making. Right here in the front row. I kind of want to expand upon what Adam was saying before with the algorithms, and you kind of mentioned it in your last discussion. Um, when we're on these websites and we get into our feedback loops, we click on the news, or they influence the way we think, they influence the way we shop, even in some they influence the way we date even. And so I, with your al algorithm discussion, maybe this is feasible, maybe this is not, I kind of thought about big tobacco companies and how if I wanted to buy tobacco, it has to tell me that it has negative consequences on my health and I, it can produce cancer, not for people under the age of 19 or whatever. Do you think the same thing can be applied in the digital world? Kind of like a, a preface almost when you enter into these things that's saying, hey, here's the algorithms that are used, here's how they're harmful to you or potentially can influence you. I think it's plausible. I don't think the harm story, I think the harm story is there. I don't think it's as clear, right? So when I was growing up, um, my parents would complain to me about being addicted to television or video games. And I think you do see certain conversations happening here. But I don't disagree with you that there may be attendant harms. I think we need to think through like what are those harms? What kinds of disclosures um, will be helpful? If, right, if you get a thing you know, every day when you sign on or at the beginning of when you use an app, I'm not even sure how useful that would be, but right, that says, look, looking at this news feed is going to send you into a loop where you're going to see more of what you are interested in. And there is the following reasons to believe that for some people this may expose you to content that tends to radicalize. Right? This is a story we hear a lot. Um, what is that going to do to people? Right, because a lot of what I think is going on, um, and I mean this in like a value neutral kind of way, is feeding people what they appear to want. And when I say appear, not when you ask them, what do you want to look at? But rather, what they actually look at, right? And I mean, this is certainly true for me, like on Twitter, like I know I dwell on certain people, and I'm not sure it's positive, right? Um, the question is whether the disclosure regime gets you what you need. Um, I'm not necessarily averse. I'm not sure 
that it does the work that we think it's going to do. I mean, my general read of history is that new communications media are profoundly disruptive. They always are. How the printing press was, um, you know, look at the pamphleteers of the early Re American Republic. Like, you know, maybe that was misinformation and really bad pamphlet. All sorts of things you can read about it, but radio, television, and so forth. Um, we're going through another one. This one feels very real. Um, whether the disclosure regime is the right way to do it, I think big question number one. Big question number two is like, what does all this mean for the First Amendment? And I think that's another, you know, big thing to tackle. That's a great, it's a great question. It raises all kinds of profound questions. Are algorithm speech? Is the editorial judgment that's implicit in an algorithm speech? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. That's a really difficult question, right? Um, and I think it's something that we're increasingly going to have to wrestle with because there is momentum for, for dealing with that. Section 230 is something we haven't mentioned yet. I'm not sure if the FTC has any role in, in looking at that or enforcing that. For those of you who don't know, this is immunity from liability for platforms for based on the, the for things that their users post. That's a very crude way of summarizing it. So you can't sue Facebook because some Facebook user posted defamation. That's a very crude summary, but it's many people believe it's a key part of making the internet what it is. Other people believe that it's causing a lot of social harms. Is that something you want to quickly opine on? So it's not our statute. Um, it's part of the Communications Decency Act, which itself is part of the Communications Act, so that's FCC over there, different agency. Um, occasionally, we hit 230 roadblocks in some of our enforcement. It's not a major factor, feature of what we do, but I do think, you know, with 230, one of the things that Congress has begun talking about that to me is like low-hanging fruit in this debate that probably adds a little bit more accountability and liability in a good way, um, but doesn't make it so ruinous that you see especially a lot of smaller companies unable to do what they need to do, is to allow us, right, federal civil law enforcers, um, to get around 230. The criminal folks can do it, we can't, um, but maybe that's not the way it should be. And here's another thought just to append to that on, on the subject we were talking about, algorithms. Publishers normally can be sued for defamation that they publish because they are presumed to have editorial control. Choosing to use an algorithm to arrange posts, arguably, is an editorial decision. Right? So it's, it's not obvious that you should be immune from, from lawsuits when you are using an algorithm to put things in front of your user and deem certain things more important than others. I saw we had Paul Pope, Professor Paul Pope from our Intelligence Studies uh, Project. Hi, I'm a, mainly focused on security and, and not a lawyer, um, but the, the conversation where we are right now is exactly what I wanted to ask about, and you were almost touching on it right then. So every time um, the issue of harm from algorithm comes up, people bring up 230, and that's really not what I want to talk about, not, the, not protection from um, the content that's there. But if, if someone said, I was harmed because of your algorithm, I as a company was harmed because of your algorithm. My son is dead because of your algorithm, or something like that. How do they get relief? And is there a way that they could make a case that the algorithm, not the content, but what the algorithm was doing with the content, was harmful? How, how do they? How could I make a case like that in the United States? I want to sue somebody for their algorithm. Is that possible? Or I want to? I want to write a letter to you guys and have you look into it. Right. It's a great question. I don't know that I have a good answer. Um, you know, to me, this is almost like, like a Paul's graph thing, right? Like how close was the algorithm to the harm caused? Um, leaving aside like some of the interesting standing, quest standing questions that we've seen uh, in US courts. But, you know, the bad thing about you gets pushed out more than it would have. I'm trying to think of the scenario. Um, Let's say a kid becomes an incel. Um, if you know what an incel is, I've heard the term, but I basically female hating violent men. Okay, and uh, and and they have like gone on a rampage and killed people who committed suicide. So if that was my son, and I believe that your algorithm took him in that direction, could I go get relief for that or make that case before a judge or a jury? 
I mean, look, anyone can try to make a case. Could they succeed? I just don't know. I think this is probably a lot of principles of tort law that I don't have at my yeah. um, well, at the ready. One thing, and my, the real reason I wanted to ask you is because I don't think it's easy to do that in a court. And so, if and the other point I was trying to actually get at was you, what you said earlier was that's FCC. I love the way you started with you know what the original purpose of FTC was in terms of you know products doing things that they claiming to do things they didn't do, and, and it seems to me that this is that jurisdiction, not, not the FCC control. Yeah, that, that was just a 230 point. So this is, to the extent it falls under anything on the consumer protection side, it would be our unfairness test. And in the, in the 80s, Congress kind of gave us a law that said what unfair meant. So you'd have to show substantial injury. You'd have to show that it was unavoidable by the consumer, and then critically, and this is where the rubber is going to meet the road here, you have to show that the business practice, essentially that the harms outweigh the benefits. Um, and I would think when it comes to algorithms, that's where the rubber, however broad unfairness may be, that's where the rubber is going to meet the road. Because then whatever the company gets to bring, well, look at all of the benefits that this thing, and you know, isn't it unfortunate that that happened, but, um, and that's, that's a difficult discussion. Um, I don't know how that would shape. Since we're on a national, oh, we have another question there. Hey, uh, so I recently joined this Strauss Center, and I come from an engineering background. And in particular, I do research about like privacy-preserving methods of computation. And uh, my observation is that actually the big tech companies are absorbing this uh, field of research. All the papers that are coming are coming from Facebook research labs, Google, uh, Apple, and all these sorts. And I don't know uh, what your views are about, like, as an FTC person on this field of research. Like, do you want to just like step aside and let the research do the work, or like, uh, does the FTC want to kind of like step in and just like release some guidelines about like differential privacy, for example, or uh, these kind of stuff? So I think my fundamental answer is yes and. Right. I do think there is a role for some regulatory intervention. I said before, I think we ought to have a national privacy law. And I think in the meantime, we ought to continue to do our work of ferreting out unfair and deceptive conduct. But I am also an eternal optimist when it comes to the power of privacy enhancing technology. Just to come back to a point we were talking about at the beginning, um, one of the really interesting tensions that I think we're seeing with some of these technologies is that they have kind of negative competition effects, or at least some people will complain that they do. And this is just a tension we need to grapple with, as opposed to having Pollyannish assumptions that the two always align. Um, and the trade-off may be worth it, but I do think you, know, you can be in a yes and world where you're having innovation aimed at improving privacy, and I think we should. Like, I want to see more innovation. I want to see more competition on privacy, but also still allowing room for some level of regulatory intervention. So we were talking about selling uh, consumer data to third parties. Um, does like your DNA data, like or, you know, like 23andMe, does that fall under that sort of third party selling? Um, and is there any sort of like concern with the FTC over how that sort of you know biographical data is being handled and potentially, you know, so spread? yes, <laughs> um, you know, I think health data has already been singled out. Um, actually, not just under HIPAA, but something called the Health Breach Notification Act that has notification obligations when there's a breach um, of certain kinds of companies uh, with health data. Um, and the reason for that is exactly the intuition that you're expressing, which is that um, this kind of data in particular, like this isn't just where my IP address has been, although that too can reveal sensitive information. This, we all agree, is sensitive information. And so it makes a lot of sense for the law to have um, special cognizance of, of the potential harms that might flow from it. We're doing like a rulemaking proceeding on the Health Breach Notification Act and asking these kinds of questions. And we have one last question over here. Um, so one of my big concerns, and we've been kind of talking about this, is the big data collection and um, selling of that data. So Facebook, Google, they have most of that um, collection. So um, for 
like do you under the FTC is that something that is like unfair those companies that are collecting so much of that data um, compared to companies that aren't and do you foresee like taxes uh, data taxes in the near future for those big companies so I don't foresee taxing as where the public policy ends up landing um, in part because a lot of the attempts to sort of treat data transfers as property transfers end up being terrifically complicated. Um, how are you taxing? Who are you taxing? All the questions that attend to taxation. Um, I think that data collection is not going away. Like I just don't, it's hard to see a world where, I mean, I guess you could, you could just ban a lot of things, but with those things come a lot of free goods and services that people like. <clears throat> it's hard to see that as the end state. I think people are going to continue to look at what kind of data is, be co is being collected, how it's being processed, to Adam's point, how it's being sold. One of the interesting things, though, when you mentioned Google and Facebook, is only in a certain kind of colloquial sense do they really sell data. Um, mostly what they do is sell ads. Um, and that's a different behavior, right? You know that they're doing it, and so maybe your creepiness is reduced, I mean, depending on who you are. Again, like I'm not judging it, but they certainly have a lot of data coming in from a lot of, including a lot of really valuable data. And you know, data, I have an engineer, d data are not one to one, right? More recent data is more valuable. Data about your commercial transactions is more valuable. That's what, and then you've got two different things going on simultaneously. Like, so one is we're collecting your data through the algorithms to continue to push to you what you want. That maximizes engagement. That keeps you where we want you so that we can push ads. But the valuable data, or the most valuable data, is like which ads are best. Because what people really, really care about right, um, is row ads. Right? They care about the return <laughs> on the ad spending. Like a company wants to know, and this has been why online advertising has exploded. Um, and people have some questions about whether it's people are being honest. But basically, the old saw about you know that half your advertising works, but you don't know which half, we've moved away from that. Now we know a lot more, like what you look at, for how long you look at it, whether you click on it, whether you buy. Incredibly important information if you're trying to sell a product. Um, and so I don't think that all of that is going away. Well, thank you, guys. I think that these questions were fantastic. And this is actually very useful input for Noah, for me. I teach about this stuff. This field is shaped largely by intuitions about privacy, about dignity, about the ways in which practices like those Noah was just describing either offend our dignity or don't. And we think they're valuable. Uh, and so your participation was great. Uh, and I think, Noah, we're so delighted to have you here. It's very rare that you get a policymaker who can talk uh, with the savvy of a Washington operator, but also with the depth of a professor. Uh, and so I think we're very fortunate to have people like you in government and delighted to have had you at UT. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adam. You are far too kind, as always. But it is really a delight and an honor for me to be here. So thank you guys for taking the time. Thank you again. And thank you, everyone, for coming. <laughs>